Welcome back to my History of Renal Medicine lecture series, in which we explore the colorful history of our understanding of one of the most important organs in the human body. We begin the next part of our journey in the ruins of an abandoned ancient city, an outpost on the far edge of the crumbling Western Roman Empire, as it might have appeared in the year 500 AD. All that was left of it by this time was its walls, and a few fragments of concrete. So forgotten and irrelevant was this place during this time that it is said the invading Saxons, the ones of the Arthurian legends, didn't even bother to enter its walls, preferring instead to set up camp outside. If we were to go back a few hundred years before, to the time of Galen, one could see this place in its formative state, as a settlement which would grow and grow over the next 200 years into a bustling city with a long bridge over a wide river leading to a settlement on its south bank called the South Works, or South Wark, or Southwark. Traces of this ancient city can still be seen today. Although this place would spend the greater part of the Dark Ages as an abandoned shadow, it would eventually be repopulated and ever so slowly rebuild itself into one of the greatest cities to ever rise from the earth. Its name, of course, is London. My name is Matthew Tortora, and I practice diagnostic pathology in northern New Jersey, serving Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center and Clara Moss Medical Center. This is the third part of a multi-part lecture series on the history of renal medicine, which I've given before to the Departments of Pathology, Medicine, and Humanities at Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center. This is part one of the second lecture, entitled Sphygmographs, Lardaceous Livers, and Dropsical Effusions, A Far and Bright Journey from Richard Bright to Theodore Farr. We're going to pick up roughly where we left off at the end of the previous lecture. Let's get started. Although this lecture takes place in the 19th century, I begin with a quote from the early 20th century. It is not possible to diagnose accurately during life the anatomic changes that will be found in the kidney after death. It is my goal with this lecture series to show that the viewer, how this ideology, one that persisted for millennia, was overturned. Let's, let's fast forward from the ruins of the 5th century to London in the 15th century, here viewed from the banks of Southwark. By 1485, this man, Henry Tudor, would lay claim to the throne as Henry VII and establish the most memorable diagnostic line in all of British history. London, by this time had finally started to fill out the limits of his ancient walls, which were still standing, and the current incarnation of its bridge over the Thames River, the London Bridge, had been carrying people to and from Southwark for 500 years now. And its population had reached a respectable 68,000, the greatest of any city in England. You re may remember from our last lecture that this time period aligned with the beginning of the Scientific Revolution. Thus, Henry VII would have been a contemporary of Nicholas Copernicus. And by the time of the 16th century, giants such as Vesalius, da Vinci, and Galileo lived alongside the likes of Henry VII's son, Henry VIII. And his children, one of which was Elizabeth, would play a small part in our story by establishing a charter for Gresham College in 1597, its mission being to bring free education to Londoners. It was the first institute of higher education in London. And as we enter the 17th century, members of the Stuart dynasty now sit on the throne. And as you may recall from the previous lecture, we are now in the midst of the European Enlightenment and some of its most prominent figures are living right here in England. As for the Stuarts, it was Charles II, inspired by the group of educators at Gresham College, who set about founding 
the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, or the Royal Society. It was founded in 1660 and was responsible for the Philosophical Transactions, which was the first journal dedicated exclusively to science. Its first editor was Christopher Wren, and its first edition featured the microscopic observations of one Robert Hooke. By the late 17th century, London had finally started to spill beyond the bounds of its ancient footprint. Its western edge was even beginning to merge with Westminster at the bottom left of the map. And now we reach the era of Marcello Malpighi, who was publishing his seminal works on the anatomic substructure of the lungs, kidney, and other organs in Italy. Moving up to the 18th century, England had a new dynastic family, the Hanovers, imported straight from northern Germany and comprising, comprised mostly of men named George and one woman named Victoria. One of these Georges would make a small and unflattering appearance later on in our story. And London at this time continued to grow and grow. Enter Thomas Guy, a phenomenally successful publisher and investor, who, perhaps feeling a bit guilty about his wealth and having no heirs to leave it to, spent the later part of his life as a philanthropist, making some of the largest charitable donations of the 18th century for endowments to hospitals. Right before he died, he began work on building his very own hospital, breaking ground for it across the London Bridge in Southwark. London Bridge at this time was a fascinating relic of early medieval London and would have been a sight for sore eyes. Over the centuries, as land became more scarce in the city, buildings began to spring up on the bridge itself, and eventually it was packed with these structures, some of which were six stories tall. To further maximize use of space, the top floors of buildings on opposing sides connected together, leaving only a narrow, poorly lit corridor for travelers to cross the bridge. Crossing the bridge into Southwark, one would have traveled down High Street to arrive at the gates of the new Guy's Hospital. And in a hundred years' time, some of the greatest advances in renal medicine and medical science would take place right beyond those gates. For context, we are now at the time of Giovanni Morgagni, who I also spoke about in the last lecture. He wrote his seminal work about human anatomy in De Cetibus in 1761, and is considered the father of pathologic anatomy, although it's important to note that even up until now, there was a distinct lack of microscopic analysis in our understanding of anatomy. Let's travel forward to the 19th century to talk about the early life of an Englishman named Richard, who will play a pivotal role in this lecture. As a young man, he would travel on an expedition from England to Iceland, where he would study nature and all the while absorbing the rich, rugged beauty of his surroundings. He would return to England and train under surgeon Sir Astley Cooper. Sir Astley Cooper was a surgeon and anatomist, and he contributed to many things, including vascular surgery, our understanding of the mammary gland, the testis, surgeries involving the hernia. He was appointed Surgeon General to George IV, William IV, and Victoria. His name lives on to the present day in the form of the suspensory ligaments of Cooper in the breast and Cooper's ligament in the inguinal canal. Young Richard happened to be in London at a very important time, as it was right about this time that liberal politicians like Thomas Macaulay were enacting a number of reforms, social and otherwise, in an effort to improve the living conditions in the city. One of these reforms was a bill that allowed physicians to dissect the human body after death. This is important because it allowed Richard and his colleagues to do what they were about to do. Now here we see, be, see before us the Thames River in London looking towards Southwark as it would have appeared in the early 1820s. Before crossing the river, Richard would have paused for a moment to contrast the new London Bridge on the left to the ruins of the recently demolished old London Bridge on the right, one that had stood for a millennium. And now he's on his way to begin work as a physician at Guy's Hospital. His full name is Richard Bright. 
he will join two other physicians, Thomas Hodgkin and Thomas Addison, to form what would become known as the Three Great. They would go on to understanding, to revolutionize our understanding of numerous medical afflictions. But as this is a discussion about renal medicine, it will focus on Richard Bright. To give context of London in the 1820s, one might conjure up stately images of Queen Victoria, the revival Gothic spires of the Parliament Building, the Soaring Tower Bridge, or the works of Charles Dickens. But that would be incorrect. In the 1820s, the decidedly less stately King George IV was sovereign. The Parliament Building wasn't built yet, its predecessor having only recently burned to the ground. And Charles Dickens was only a boy, while his father, an exceptionally poor role model, was no doubt inspiring his young son's future writings. Speaking of George IV, he plays into our story in a tangential way. You see, although he is portrayed like this, in reality he looked like this. He rarely left his quarters being plagued by ill health, in particular something that was called dropsy. In this image, we can see a poor soul afflicted by the dropsy, her swollen belly being drained of fluid. So what was dropsy? Well, dropsy was massive edema. And to give a context, to give a glimpse rather, into the still archaic state of medicine as it existed at the time, I will read its definition from the time. The dropsy is looked on as an unnatural tumor in which all the body or some of its parts is swelled to an unimaginable bulk. Tis observed that this swelling may be produced by three several sorts of matter, namely by phlegm, wind, and water. That which proceeds from phlegm is called anasaka or lensa phlegmatia, a piteous dropsy. That caused by wind, tympaxites, or a tympany, and that formed by water, asiates. Now, dropsy was only recently discovered to be not a disease in itself, but a result of other diseases. Edema or dropsy, hypertension, hematuria, oliguria, albinuria, uremia, were well described, but the underlying processes remained completely obscure. So they knew that edema could be severe in some people. They knew that it occurred in conjunction with other conditions, such as hypertension or high blood pressure, or protein in the urine, um, but they didn't know what caused it. Rising out of this disorder was Richard Bright's landmark publication from Guy's Hospital in 1827, a paper of observations on the anatomic associations of dropsy and other disease, entitled Reports of Medical Cases and On. The text of its preface heralds the arrival of what would be the greatest attempt to overturn the tenets of the quote I read from H.A. Christian earlier in this lecture to date. Quote, to connect accurate and faithful observations after death with symptoms displayed during life must be in some degree to forward the objects of our noble art. Within passages of the introduction, it is worth stopping to appreciate the historical importance of Bright's assertions. Quote, the morbid appearances which present themselves on the examination of those who have died with dropsical effusion, either into the large cavities of the body or into the cellular membrane, are exceedingly various, and it often becomes a matter of doubt how far these organic changes are to be regarded as originally causing or subsequently aiding the production of the effusion. In other words, edema is associated with many conditions which was already known but to Bright, it was not clear as to which ones caused it and which ones were caused by it. Quote, if it were possible to arrive at a perfect solution of these questions, we might hope to obtain the highest reward which can repay our labors, an increased knowledge of the nature of the disease, and improvement in the means of its treatment. In other words, if we could better understand the cause, we might find a treatment. This may sound intuitive to a layperson today, but it was revolutionary at the time. In his reports of medical cases, he further emphasizes the importance of connecting symptoms with morphologic changes. He makes a connection between a physical change and a laboratory abnormality, protein in the urine in this instance. 
Now again, these concepts seem rote to the modern audience, but were, again, revolutionary in 1827. Now one thing that hasn't changed is that good writing sells better when accompanied by good pictures, and a good illustrator could achieve stunning results. The drawings from this 19th century atlas of anatomy, for example, are works of art in and of themselves. As it would have been hard to find an artist specializing only in medical dissections in the 1820s, Bright collaborated with a portrait artist named Richard Say. As you can see, his reputation certainly preceded him. Here is Say's portrait of Richard Bright, which still hangs in Guy's Hospital today. Say would put the same gorgeous craftsmanship into each and every drawing for Bright's reports of medical cases. And now for cases illustrative of some of the appearances observable on the examination of diseases terminating in dropsical effusion. And in Bright's preferred order and first of the kidney. He presented 24 cases compiled over 12 years, including 16 full color plates. Let's look at a few of these revolutionary observations. One can appreciate the cobbled outer surface of the granular kidney, the paleness of the non-vascular kidney, the small contracted kidney of long-standing kidney disease, the large white kidney of a patient with, quote, nephrotic syndrome, which includes edema and protein in the urine, and the large red kidney of, quote, acute nephritis, that is, acute kidney disease. Bright's reports of medical cases showed us that edema and protein in the urine were related to renal disease by connecting them to depictable structural pathologic changes in the kidney. Bright's observations of the kidney would enter the historical vernacular as Bright's disease, a term broadly applied to acute and chronic kidney disease, usually in the setting of edema, protein in the urine, and later high blood pressure. It's a term that would persist well into the 20th century. As for Bright, he became known as the father of nephrology and would witness the birth of clinical nephrology. Perhaps more extraordinary than Bright's work is what followed in its aftermath, which you will learn all about in my next lecture. Thank you again for joining me. Once again, if I've piqued your interest in the history of medicine or in pathology, feel free to contact me or follow me on X at Renal Pathology.